Good afternoon and welcome to our joint BSI IFE webinar, where we'll be further exploring the Building Safety Act with a focus on the process that fire engineers and fire safety consultants should adopt when supporting the principal accountable person in the development of fire safety information and deliverables that will be assessed during the gateways process. For those of us that have not met before, my name is Anne Bird and I'm head of built environment sector here in BSI and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's session. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping first, please. Next slide. As you're probably all fully aware, and there are many people uh, joining us online as I speak, this is a, 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 a listen-only webinar that is being recorded, okay? It is being recorded. We really do welcome your questions. In fact, what makes this such a powerful forum is the questions we get asked. And so we'll take questions at the end of uh, the presentations from our two speakers today, uh, but do use the Q&A function on the platform to lodge your questions. We've already had a great many questions, but we'd really welcome more from you. So please do not hand back, put your questions in. By the same token, using the same platform, um, if you have any technical difficulties, please submit your question, uh, your difficulty via the Q&A function and a member of the team will try and help you and get you back on listening to the webinar that we're running today. Um, as is always the way, you know, upon completion of the feedback, and we really need your feedback, please uh, note that BSI, we will send you a recording of this session today. So you can look back over it, you can share it with colleagues back in the office, whatever you see fit. But please, it's a big ask from me. I mean, We've got two great speakers for you today. And the way we can take these webinars forward and actually understand ideas of what else you want us to present is to get feedback from you. So that's really, really important. As is the importance of CPD, because I have to do it for all of my institutions as well. So again, please request your certificate via the feedback survey following the webinar. Okay, I think that's enough of that. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Can I kindly ask for both Colin and Mark to turn on your webcams, please? Hello, Colin. Hello, Mark. Um, it's great to see you both. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. I know you are both extremely busy professionals, and so we really appreciate you making the time. Just so everybody knows, because of the bandwidth uh, uh, process, we typically turn off our cameras while we're presenting, and we'll do that here when we get in. But I just wanted to get cameras on just to introduce our great speakers for today. So we first up, first speaker is Colin Blatchford Brown. He's got a CV after my own heart because Colin has worked in building control profession for over 30 years, both public and private sectors, working on a variety of projects, including high rise resi and commercial developments, but also he had involvement in Hinkley Point C nuclear power station too. Colin has provided technical training for the REBA, RICS, and is in fact an RICS APC chairman and assessor as well as being an RICS registered expert witness. But if that's not enough, what's keeping Colin busy now is his role within the Building Safety Programme, where he is the lead operational policy development individual for the building control function for higher risk buildings. So welcome, Colin. We are also kindly joined today by Mark, Mark Chubb. Uh, Mark is chair of the Institution of Fire Engineers Board of Trustee Directors, and currently also serves as the institution's technical director. And he joins us today from his home in the United States. So thank you once again. I know Mark's taking many phone calls already today, but it's early with Mark too. Mark has a career spanning more than 40 years and he's held senior executive and technical roles in the public, private and non-profit sectors in the US and New Zealand. So I'm sure you'll agree, a great lineup of speakers. We'll turn our cameras off now and we'll hand over Colin to move into our first presentation of the webinar. Colin. Over to you. Thank you, Ant, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm tasked with to try and explain the Building Safety Act and your role um, in the design and construction um, of new higher risk buildings and maybe some existing ones as well. And just to pinpoint the role that you have and the part that you can all play in ensuring the safety of occupants and making sure that they feel safe in their homes. So that's the sort of context I've got to tackle in 25 minutes or so. Uh, if we can move on to the next um, slide, that one, that's perfect. So 
as with all things relating to the Building Safety Act, it's really important to look at it in context as a holistic act. And whilst you may think that only certain elements apply to you, um, I would urge you to think again, because the act sets up a considerable amount of change across the whole of the construction industry. And whilst it does change the legislative framework for high risk buildings, it does affect the uh, requirements upon you as uh, designers and potentially contractors and clients in relation to the whole built environment. And that's framed within the, the new Building Safety Regulator's three main and principal functions. Those are on the screen. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but effectively, we as a regulator have a duty to ensure the safety and standards of all buildings. We need to make sure that we're looking out to see what trends and changes are happening, whether it's modern methods of construction, more innovative designs, to ensure that those are still achieving the aims of regulation. We're also um, charged with ensuring competence for those that are designing and constructing buildings. And that's all buildings, not just higher risk buildings. So whilst we, again, might think it's just about these tall residential blocks, please bear in mind that that, that scope is much more wide than that. And it, it changes the building control profession. It makes myself as a, hopefully, a registered building inspector, a protected profession. And so there will be um, more standardized expectations of the way in which the building control profession delivers its function. And those duties, one of which will be falling to the BSR, the regulator, will be to enforce the building regulations. And, and enforcement has a, a wide connotation, but there's an awful lot there to unpick. We won't have time today, and um, perhaps those of you that might want to join us, some of you may have been on my um, Q&A session this morning about enforcement. It does affect everything as well. If we can move on to the next slide, I wanted to set the, the next bit of context really, and that whilst we'll touch on duty holders in a moment, but whilst we have um, a new set of information, a new set of legislative requirements, we're, we're all aware of the golden thread of information, and we all understand what those principles are trying to achieve. Effectively, we we can't separate the golden thread of information from any of the steps along the journey through gateway planning gateway one, through gateway two, three, and into occupation. And we need to ensure that all the way through the process, we have this evidence, this, this documentation, the information to ensure that those people involved at those different stages have access to the right information at the right time, and it's available to the right people. And this is where you play a part in this. If we move on to the next slide, Thank you. Um, and we'll touch on this in some detail in a moment. And it, and it really is critical for us because what the golden thread of information is will change throughout the life of a project. It will move as you go through the design phase and it will move into something different as you start building that particular high risk building. At the gateway to, and we'll focus on that in a second, it is that information that you're going to rely upon to demonstrate compliance with building regulations. And that's all of the building regulations, not just fire safety and structure, which is often uh, misinterpreted. This is all of them, A to S. And what that does is sets you up a set of agreed information that you will then move forward to build. So the, the golden thread of information will change throughout the life of the project. And what we're really keen to focus in, in on here is that you can backtrack, you can go back to find the information you relied upon through design, but you're then moving into a different phase. Through construction, if we move on to the next slide, we're, un we're understanding that you are gathering the evidence to support the assertion that what you have built was in line with what was approved by the regulator for these higher risk buildings. And if change happens, which inevitably it will through any uh, construction project, that you have the evidence to support the fact that that change was recorded properly, was assessed as to whether it needs a reapproval through the regulator, or that you've got that evidence gathering through into uh, the, the, com the completion phase through gateway three. So it's just important to, to understand your role here is to be provided with sufficient information and access to information if you think there's a, an issue 
to have involvement probably through that construction phase, potentially to ensure that what was designed, maybe by yourselves, is actually being translated into the actual physical building and ensuring that nothing changes. And if it does, being able to raise that as a concern and get that dealt with. Move on to the next phase and we'll just pick up the last bit through um, the completion stage. And that is really to ensure that that as built information, that evidence capture through the construction phase is there as a complete entity so that you can rely upon that as the evidence to give to the regulator that you have met all the relevant and applicable functional requirements of building regulations. And of course, all that commissioning evidence, um, everything gathered together to provide that narrative, that end to end and holistic approach. And that's really key as we start talking about what the regulator is likely to expect from the outset at the gateway to building regulations approval stage, because you'll see as we start talking about the assumptions and the questions the regulator might ask at that stage, it's really important to understand how you'll end up with the finished product. And equally, as you move into the inoccupation phase, that the responsible person under the fire, fire safety order, the accountable person under the Building Safety Act, have sufficient information through uh, the golden thread of information to understand how the building works, how it should be managed, and any maintenance and ongoing um, review of particular provisions is scheduled in for the life of the building to maintain safety of occupants. If we can move on to the next slide, and this is one of my um, favorite slides, and, and this really does highlight some of the changes that are being made. So many of you will appreciate the Building Safety Act in part is an enabling piece of legislation to uh, make changes to the existing legislation. And one of those is the Building Act. And if you can notice here that this is a copy of the Building Act with the amendments made by the Building Safety Act. And you can see that up to about, well, probably around about 50% of the Building Act itself is amended by the Building Safety Act. So if you thought about, if you thought you knew what was in the Building Act, maybe it's time to reread it. This has all been published and you can go and look at it through um, the Building Safety Act and the changes it makes. It is quite a convoluted method, but it is there. What this also does is make provisions for changes to building regulations and the same principle applies. So around about 50% of what you know and love as building regulations, whether it's procedural um, or the introduction of new duty holder roles, and I'll talk about that in a second, are made through changes to building regulations. Now, I fully appreciate that secondary legislation is still um, to be published. It is imminent. It will be here very soon. But if you look at the consultation document issued by DLUC at the end of the summer last year, you'll get a good flavour of what's expected to come. There are um, a few bits and pieces still being worked through just to make sure it all hinges together, because as I said from the outset, this has to be viewed as a whole. You, you can't independently take a section of building regulations without understanding the implications it has to other parts of the Act itself. So it's really quite critical to understand this. this is a one big piece of legislation that all works together. And spotting those linkages is where the, the, the sort of major gains will be made if you can get that all in your head. And I'll try and explain how Gateway 2 and how that move into inoccupation works. If we can move on to the next slide, I'll sort of touch on the duty holder roles. And this is where you come in potentially here because within the building regulations themselves, so the secondary legislation, there will be um, a series of new duty holder roles, client, principal designer, principal contractor. And those roles are there to ensure compliance with building regulations. Now, and that's not just the technical requirements, it's also the, the, the functional procedural requirements. So ensuring that sufficient notices are provided to the regulator when required, that applications are submitted, that approvals are given and sought at the right stages. So this, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about how that will all work um, as a sort of entity, but essentially this, this new duty holder role will include the provision for cooperation, for communication between all of those duty holders throughout the process, not just I'm going to appoint a fire engineer to solve a problem that I 
missed through the my design work this is a bit more nuanced than that you need to get that um, expertise the right people involved at the right stage of a design to ensure compliance with building regulations and and of course the key sort of uh, linchpin to this is competence we can't have um, those that are not competent designing uh, buildings and we need to make sure that we get the right level of competence and that's one of the key roles of the client to appoint the right people at the right time and be assured ask the right questions um, at that appointment stage to ensure the people that they they appoint throughout the process are the right people to ensure compliance with building regulations so that's all of them but we're going to focus a little bit more on the fire safety side for obvious reasons today now alongside those duty holder roles i i've always sort of mentioned enforcement powers for building control authorities and this links together quite neatly the building safety regulator is the building control authority for higher risk buildings and it's critical to understand that the, the enforcement powers we have are for all provisions of building regulations and that includes the duty holder roles so if you're not doing your job as a duty holder the regulator can take enforcement action i won't go into too much detail to that there might be some questions but we, we can pick those up if we can jump on to the next slide please and this is um this is a slightly complicated slide it may have dropped off a little bit of the golden thread at the bottom but rest assured there's a bottom banner that says golden thread of information and that follows from beginning to end and these are the gateways you, you know about the gateways you know what they mean in principle i'll work from the the far right hand side and work my way backwards and then we'll delve into well what does that mean for me what am i going to have to do effectively the two little white boxes at the end are the really critical ones you need to register um, your high risk building before you can occupy and in order to register you need a completion certificate just one back from the gateway three that is the gateway three application so you need a completion certificate to be able to register and you need both before you can occupy and if you occupy before either of those you are committing an offence so what we're then working back our way through is that completion process that evidence as we said that your building has been built in accordance with what was approved and that you have the evidence to demonstrate that to the regulator and that's all the commissioning information inspection program change control log all of the relevant as built information now that's critical because this is your opportunity to demonstrate to the regulator you've done things properly now i'm not suggesting that in in the industry things aren't done properly now but we just need more evidence to demonstrate it and this is that that hook that gateway three application to the regulator now as you move our way back to gateway two um, it's quite clear that we'll need to have some on-site presence and we'll be undertaking site inspections and, and interventions as one would expect of a building control body throughout the construction process and we'll set an inspection schedule for those elements but those will all be linked to the risks as we see them the identified elements of construction that we might need to have evidence for and we will ask you and test you that you have that um, and to make sure that what you are building a client is building is in accordance with the gateway to building control approval application so very much look at the end game we're trying to get to that completion certificate which is what your next ticket to allow, allow you to register that completed building that's got to match with what you had approval to build so it's looking forward from um, things like the fire and emergency file we'll touch on that in a second to those building safety risks in occupation have you identified them are they clear how are you going to manage them what's the maintenance on ongoing maintenance provision and what are the management arrangements in sort of fire safety terms how is this building going to be effectively and safely managed through its life looking at the golden thread the duty holder role and then taking that planning gateway one initial sort of ideas of the planning of, of the fire statement to ensure that those are translated through the detailed design phase so what does that mean how are we going to do that um, what are we going to allow uh, or how are we going to approach it if we can move on to the next slide and I'll spend a bit more time on this one because in essence we as the regulator are expecting how shall I put this we're expecting a more detailed submission for your building control approval um, application I think our sort of evidence so far is that 
building control submissions are a little bit uh, variable in terms of the quality of submission, the, the content of that submission, and can often have elements of design that aren't fully resolved. Um, so what the regulator is going to be looking for is that um, fully resolved design, and especially around the fire strategy. I don't think it's really acceptable to start building something if you don't know that it will work from a fire safety perspective. And I think we as the regulator are going to have to hold designers and duty holders to account to ask them those questions. And that's really how we start. Bearing in mind, we are making sure that we comply with functional requirements of building regulations, which haven't changed. Um, we need to understand how you've arrived at that position where you um, are confident that that is the case. So we're expecting as the regulator for you to tell us that your building does indeed comply with the functional requirements and then to outline through a series of uh, prescribed documents and we can talk about those in a little bit of detail um, and the full plans and the fire strategies and other documents to support that submission you're going to tell us how you've achieved that so looking at that in terms of its um, constituent elements we we are going to be undertaking initial reviews and we're then going to move that forward if everything is there as we think it should be We'll move on to that full plan assessment as you would expect from a building control body but just to bear in mind that if if we think there are elements that aren't fully developed or there's no answer or there's insufficient justification the regulator is not going to approve or move forward to the full assessment so this is where that dialogue has to happen we will be talking to you as designers we will be talking to you as clients and making sure we have that information in the right order so what does this do? This sets up an, uh, and encourages really duty holders to carefully consider how compliance will be achieved for each applicable building regulation requirement. And in terms of fire safety, that's ensuring that the relevant provisions of building regulations have been met. And I suppose in the first instance that the, the guidance that you might use, the guidance document, whether it be approved documents or whether it be British standards, are indeed appropriate for the building you're submitting and i think that really is our first question is there sufficient evidence to demonstrate that this is the right guidance to use in meeting the functional requirement and we want that justified we want that evidence to show that it is and if it isn't well what alternative method are you using i think so my experience is often the case that fire engineers probably and i'll be kind um receive designs that have maybe a bit too late in the process they're with now a fire engineer to resolve a problem that is baked in through the planning process now planning gateway one is making significant progress in addressing those issues and i think our um, percentage um, response rate with concerns has moved from somewhere around 58 percent to i think it's a low 40s now where concerns are raised at the planning gateway one stage However, low 40s after nearly two years, there's still some work to do there. And remember, at the gateway two stage, a building control approval must be granted before works can commence. So the detailed design, the fire strategy, the how you're going to manage the building in occupation, are the, are the management expectations realistic for the intended occupancy? Has that been fully considered through the process? What guidance are you using? Is it the right one? Is it appropriate? Is it relevant to the building you're designing or building? And is all of that evidence to the regulator to ensure they have the assurance required to issue an approval for you to start building? So you can see, I think, that the role of the fire engineer here is to make sure that you hold designers to account, architects, principal designers, if they haven't fully considered the fire strategy considerations or provisions, and that if there are um, unusual solutions or um, fire engineered solutions that might need further justification, that those are provided to the regulator to assure them that this will meet the functional requirements. What we aren't prepared to do is, is accept or give approval to something that hasn't been fully detailed or fully outlined. And so, for example, if we ask, is this the correct guidance document for meeting B1, then we'll expect that to be outlined. 
And just by way of reference, Section 7 of the Building Act 1984, remember I showed you some of those amendments, that has been amended to ensure that it's on you as designers, the principal designer, to ensure that that is the right approved document for your particular building. And if not, justify the suitable alternative method or guidance document to be used. So it's not quite the same as it was before, that the, perhaps the assumption that part B would be acceptable um, as a guidance document in all cases, well, we all know that's not the case, but this is really pushing that agenda and making sure that you have considered the relevance of that document. So alongside that, we're going to um, ask whether or not that it, your submission, your fire strategy and all the relevant documents actually does explain how uh, the functional requirements will be met. We will ask whether risks have been identified correctly, occupancy defines um, in accordance with what you expect, and that those design decisions are recorded. And that we will ask for that justification for use of alternative guidance documents. And as often is the case, departures from maybe approved document or British standard guidance is embedded, it's in there somewhere. How are you going to justify the solution that you've come across or come up with? And where those, so that we need that full justification of those departures from recognised guidance is, is essentially our, our critical point. So we're expecting that information to be provided to the regulator. The regulator isn't going to provide you with a big long list of things to address. It will, but it will expect you to provide that narrative and story. So I think one key takeaway here is the, the fire strategies that, that I've come across in the past, they have different purposes for different people. I personally, and we as a regulator, don't really need to be, um, to be told what's in the approved document, for example. Um, or which parts of the approved document you're meeting, because the assumption is you're going to meet that. We don't want to have sections of building regulations uh, reproduced into a fire strategy, because we know that. We know where they are and we know where to look. What we want is your narrative and story to show how you are meeting uh, functional requirements and providing a safe building. If we can move on to the next slide, and I'll sort of start to wrap up here. Um, one of the key elements of the changes and and that sort of links back to the duty holder and the expectation that information will be provided at the right time by the right people for the regulator to review is to ensure that there is proper procurement of those people right from the outset so there is good guidance out there we're expecting um, responsible clients to follow those kind of good pieces of guidance and ensure that those those elements of control through the construction phase, taking in an approved design, can be managed properly and monitored properly throughout the construction process. And I think this is another element where fire engineers can play a part, not only being procured and part of the design team earlier in the process, but equally being uh, retained to ensure certain key provisions are met or installed or built properly in accordance with the original design. Um, and that's all about having the right competence of professionals involved throughout the process and making sure there's good communication throughout. I think our take on this is that we're expecting much more complete building regulation submissions. We're expecting much more um, ownership of the how. So we not only want to know who is doing what and who is responsible for what elements, we want to know how those elements will be managed through the construction phase and how that then will manifest in terms of the evidence you're providing to the regulator at the end at the gateway three stage. And then as it moves into gateway, uh, sorry, not gateway, as it moves into the inoccupation phase, that responsibility to ensure the safe management of that building will play that part. It will, all of this information will form part of that golden thread as it moves into inoccupation. They'll be limiting it to those key building safety risks, risk of structural failure and uh, limiting fire spread. But it will all play its part. And if you have any concerns, you can go backwards to the golden thread of information through the design and construction phase and find out exactly what was built should any changes be made to that building later on. So there's clear evidence. And one, one final thing here on the gateways one, two and three, we're all well aware of Regulation 38, 
um, the golden thread of information will replace regulation 38 for higher risk buildings and there may be some questions on that but the golden thread is much more comprehensive than regulation 38 as part of that assurance at the at the gateway 3 stage the legislation and i can i can tell you this because it's in a I, I know i can um will expect the person receiving the relevant golden thread of information to confirm back to the client that they have received it and they understand it and they know what it does so it's a little bit of a subtle change in the way in which regulation 38 works currently it is actually expecting the receiving party the accountable person or principal accountable person um, to confirm they've got the information and they know and they understand how to take it forward so that's a subtle change so that will be part of the gateway three submission i think that just about wraps us up and i, I promise to do by three o'clock so i'm only two minutes over um please look at our, our bulletins because they will provide you with updated information as and when we have it uh, the secondary legislation is imminent as i say um, and it will be um, published quite quickly there are a number of webinars and seminars that we are presenting q a sessions and the like so please look at the at the index there and, and get signed up to the newsletter if you're not already there and on that note i think i'll pass over to mark who um, is going to move on to his session thank you very much thank you colin that was a, a great overview and, and thanks for the plugs for uh, engaging uh, fire engineers early and often um, I'll, I'll you'll probably hear that theme echoed a bit during during my presentation and I'll explain why that's not just an advert for our members uh, as we go through this um, next slide uh, there it is uh, engage a fire engineering uh, engage fire engineering advice as early as possible to project um, I've been working in this industry uh, for about 40 years now, and have worked in a very a variety of regulatory regimes, from purely prescriptive regulations here in the United States to uh, the performance-based regulatory regime in New Zealand, which is very similar to the UK system, and just about every variation in between. And one thing I can say with confidence, both as somebody who's been on the regulatory side and who's been on the consulting engineering side, is we're never going to have enough fire engineers to meet the demand and if you wait uh, to engage a fire engineer as if it was a 999 service uh, as, a, as a blue light service you wait until you have a problem we're almost never going to be able to give you the solution you really need um, engaging a fire engineer early is a way to ensure that you'll have the fire engineering advice you need when you need it and that it will be tailored to the scope of your project that it'll help you it'll enable you to fulfill your design intent um, fire engineering advice from the outset helps you avoid unwanted and unforeseen problems it it gives you the option to pursue greater design flexibility it often gives you the opportunity to be more innovative and cost effective than a purely prescriptive solution might uh, have, have achieved and it certainly gives you the ability to demonstrate that you're achieving equal or better performance than that required by the functional requirements of the Building Safety Act. Um, the longer you wait to engage a fire engineer, the harder it is for us to solve your problem. And the solutions become uh, much less flexible and much more difficult to integrate uh, in ways that make them easy to maintain throughout uh, the, the post-occupancy life of the building. Um, I spent long enough in the consulting engineer world to know that uh, most of the clients that I engaged uh, called me with their hair on fire saying, hey, I've got this problem. And the problem that they came to me with was never the problem that needed to be solved by an engineer. It was, I can't get uh, the regulator to let me occupy my building because I didn't do the work in advance that was required. I need you to tell, convince the, the fire engineer or convince the, the fire authority or the building authority that my building is safe. Uh, and in most cases, I couldn't do that. Uh, as a regulator, I won't do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we want to encourage folks to do is reach out to a fire engineer early, not because we're looking for higher fees and more billable time, but so that you can get your issues before a fire engineer from the outset 
and you can make a decision early how and when to engage them into what level. Uh, one of the bigger problems that we have, and, and Colin touched on this, is that if you only engage a fire engineer on an ad hoc basis, as issues arise during your project, you'll almost never get the advice and the documentation, the follow through that you need to demonstrate compliance at each of the gateways, especially gateway three. Next slide. So when you're looking for a fire engineer, uh, context matters in the same way that the context of the Building and Safety Act matters. We want you to think very carefully about who you engage uh, as a fire engineer. Um, we try to make sure that the credentials that the institution offers, uh, our fire risk assessor credentials, the various levels of engineering council registration from engineering technician to incorporated engineer to chartered engineer reflect uh, the levels of experience that our members have dealing with different kinds of problems. But those grades of membership and those credentials alone won't tell you whether or not a fire engineer has the requisite experience to work on your project. When you're looking for somebody uh, to assist you in a project, make sure they have experience working on problems like the ones you anticipate. And if you aren't sure what your problems are before you engage a fire engineer, uh, be sure to hold your fire engineer accountable for demonstrating their competence on an ongoing basis. And if they're not meeting your expectations, work with them to secure the right additional advice to meet the needs of your project. Um, one of the things that I think we want to discourage the most at this point, uh, and this is consistent with my earlier advice, is too many, uh, too many clients call fire engineers and say, hey, um, I see this requirement um, in the, the approved document, and I really don't want to do that with my building. So you, can you help me find a way around that? Or I've had advice from another engineer that if I want to pursue uh, this project, I'm going to need to do X, and I don't want to do X. Um, that's not the best way to start your relationship with your fire engineer. In fact, my advice to our members is don't take those jobs. Um, you're not there to help people not comply, you're there to help them comply. So it's very important when you initially engage a fire engineer to be very clear about what you want your project to achieve, what your design intentions are, and how you need the building to function to satisfy your needs as a client. Then ask them how to make it safe. That will get you the best advice. Next slide. So in return, your fire engineer is gonna have some expectations of you. And the first one, and this is uh, sprinkled throughout Colin's presentation, uh, this should be a collaborative enterprise. We want fire engineers to be integrated into the full design team. We want them to communicate openly and freely and on a, a timely and consistent basis with all other members of the design team and all other project stakeholders for that matter. If you engage a fire engineer uh, that doesn't do that, then you should be very wary. You should be very cautious. On the same, by the same token, a fire engineer who's told that they can't communicate with certain other members of the design team should be very wary of that client and should insist on open and continuous communication. Clients should keep an open mind about what they're asking their fire engineer to do for them. Fire engineering designs have to consider the human element. It's one of the core competencies of fire engineers uh, recognized by uh, IFE and the Engineering Council. We need to make sure, and this is a, a really important part of the, the, the post Grenfell Building uh, Safety Act reforms, we need to know that the information is being produced at every stage of the process, design, construction, operation, and maintenance, in a way that's intelligible, accessible, and usable by the duty holders and by the accountable persons. So it's really crucial at this point to remind folks that fire is not just a technical problem. Uh, certainly we ap apply technical tools and the, the, the tools of engineering to address fire safety problems in buildings. At the end of the day, uh, a mentor of mine used to say the three leading causes of fires are men, women, and children. 
And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the designs we're producing uh, fit the needs of the people who will use and occupy the building. I guess the last piece of uh, advice for people engaging fire engineers is uh, take the long view. Uh, too many projects that I've been involved with uh, are really looking for the short-term return on investment. Um, they, they look at construction cost, absent whole of life cost, uh, and they look at uh, almost any requirement as a, a trade-off uh, between what they want to do and what they have to do. And it's been my experience that that kind of thinking simply doesn't uh, reflect the nature of, of buildings in the modern era. More often than not, if we're careful and we're collaborative, we can find ways to make uh, the, the things that we have to do, do more for us. And that's particularly true in terms of looking at long-term thinking, uh, such as building resilience. Uh, in the past, our building regulations focused on uh, making buildings safe so that in the event of an emergency, everybody could get out. And if they got out safely, we considered our job well done. Today, it's equally important to businesses that they get back into those buildings after an event. The longer they're disrupted and the longer they're unable to use the building as it was intended, the more the costs will mount. And that's true whether there was any significant damage to the building or not. So we need to think carefully beyond the construction costs at how we can design and build buildings, not only to get people out, but to get them back in in a timely, safe, and efficient fashion. Next slide. So to wrap this up, um, one of the things that I wanna encourage here is that we think about the golden thread, not just as a series of documents, not as a BIM uh, solely. It's not written to uh, impress people with what we, we've done or what we know about uh, the various aspects of the project we've worked on. It's written to inform, it's written to communicate, it's written to advise. And the building safety case, as one of the principal elements of the golden thread, can't achieve its intended purpose unless we're very clear in elaborating all of our assumptions and conditions. Too often, we just drive straight to the punchline. And a lot's lost if we don't provide a proper setup. And I think the, the biggest issue I've seen with fire safety um, documentation over my years in the profession is a tendency for folks to say it's safe and here's why instead of explaining it's safe because and here's what finally a building safety case must inform the building owner occupants how their expectations their decisions and their actions are going to influence fire safety performance over the whole life of the building not just up until it gets approved for occupancy at Gateway 3. So I'll leave it there. I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions. I think we have about 16 minutes left and uh, I'm looking forward to what you want more information about. Absolutely fantastic, both of you. Great speakers. Um, wow, there's an awful lot there. If you'd like to join me and turn your cameras on, Colin and Mark, that would be great and we can, maybe start chuntering through an awful lot of questions if we may but yeah as i say thank you ever so much that was that was that was a, a great walk through what is a hugely important process um that will take us forward uh, to achieving higher levels of safety uh, no doubt about it okay right colin you know i'm going to ask this question because you and i speak at various events and we're still quite amazed at times as to some of the understanding of the application of the Building Safety Act. Colleen, mm -hmm. can you just confirm that the Building Safety Act does not just apply to HRVs, please? Yes, I can. <laughs> so we have a new regulatory framework which applies to the higher risk buildings, i.e. the Building Control Authority role for the BSR, and the in-occupation safety case building assessment certificates, duty holder roles within in-occupation. But the overall changes in terms of competence, in terms of the, the requirement to keep buildings safe across the whole built environment, and a number of changes to building regulations and the Building Act apply to everything 
where building regulations might apply and in fact a bit beyond that for the for the big scope bits for the for the regulator so yes it's it is not just higher risk buildings perfect thank you i mean we've had a number of questions here today on that front whether it's applicable to healthcare buildings or similar yes you've heard it first you know well, you've heard it from the regulator probably many times actually but that's really important and um, you know we need to keep hammering that home um, you picked up a really important point there colin about competency regime and similar so question both for you as a regulator and and, and also for mark two given the importance uh, and uh, now in a regulatory backdrop of competency how do you envisage competency being demonstrated definitively in the future will for example a level of professional membership or qualification from the ife or a degree demonstrate competency <laughs> Mark, do you want to kick off on that one or do you want me to? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're on mute, I think, Mark. I think you're on mute, Mark. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I think it's really important to distinguish between a qualification or credential and your qualifications uh, to do work uh, under this regime. Competence is defined only in part by the credentials you hold. And uh, one of the things that, that IFE is working closely with uh, all the stakeholders in the building regulatory environment uh, on right now, DLUC, um, BSR and others, is to develop a contextualized register of professionals for high-risk buildings. And that will extend to our work on risk assessments in high-risk buildings. So we're in, we're in discussions currently with the Engineering Council uh, and other professional engineering institutions to develop uh, a framework for contextualized registration. Thank you. Colin, any thoughts just, as a regulator? Yeah, I mean, I think just, just to sort of put it into two, two pieces of context, really, um, if I turn up on a building site, the responsibility for health and safety rests first and foremost with me as the individual. Um, OK, other people have duties as well, but I must make a judgment whether I'm safe to do X, Y and Z and perform X, Y and Z actions. And I think that exists here, too. I would consider myself to be a competent building control professional. However, there are some projects that I would say I don't have experience of that. So it would not be then appropriate for me to take that project forward without having that relevant experience. So I think it's understanding our own limits and being prepared to say, no, there's there's where you start. You, we all know when we're competent and when we're not. I can drive a car, but I can't drive a bus. Thank not you, very thanks. well. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, moving on. And we had to say we've got questions still coming in as well. When we went through the slides where you kindly took us Colin, around the gateway slides. We've had somebody suggest that there's a, a lack of continuity of performance requirements through the three gateways, going from guidance at planning to functional requirements and des at design and safety case in operation. Colin, any thoughts? Discuss. Well, that, that's because primarily that they all have different purposes. So the Act is, is, is sequentially trying to elicit information from each of the duty holders at the different stages. So at the planning gateway one stage, we're trying to establish that there are no, you know, complete howlers in the design that are never going to move forward to design and, and construction. Through the design and construction phase, we're ensuring compliance with building regulation, which is different than managing safety of occupants. So it's, but I, what we're looking at, it, and I said in the presentation, look at it holistically. Your end goal is to get a safe building that can be managed safely, to make sure occupants are safe and feel safe. So if you have to track that back through the through the design and the um, the construction phase to ensure that, well, that's what you do. And if that means you do more than what the functional requirements might say, that's what you do, because you you've identified the risks early. You know what you're going to be managing. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another one for, well, for both of you, but I think the regulator will have a certain view here. Is there or will there be a requirement to go through the gateways for HRB refurbishment works? Well, yeah, that's a good point. So um, what you'll find is that existing buildings often have an awful lot of building work done. 
Um, so there will be a gateway for those elements of work controlled um, or under the auspices of the building regulations. So yes, there will be gateways. What there will be is proportionate gateways. So if it's very small works, there'll be much less expectation on a huge load of prescribed documents. But if you're adding new floors or you're um, changing some kind of use of a part of a higher risk building, then you can expect that the full suite of documents will be required. Yeah, I would just add the regime can't work properly if we don't apply the same rigor to our assessment of alterations, modifications, additions uh, that we do to the original design and construction. So it's really crucial that we revisit those assumptions and conditions and outline any changes and expectations. It's one of the reasons I'm so happy to see the concept of change management reflected so consistently throughout the uh, the regulatory philosophy of the Building Safety Act. I know that comes from other other elements within HSE, but having worked in hazardous process industries as a fire engineer as well as a built environment, it was one of the things that I always thought we had missing from our regulatory regime. So I'm very glad to see that it was incorporated in uh, the Building Safety Act reforms. I'm just looking for it to happen here in the U.S. and Australasia and a few other places now. Thank you. Could I, just add, yeah, could I just add one thing there, Ant, is that in terms of the golden thread of information, this is where that plays its part, because if you've got an existing building that's gone through the gateways or indeed an existing one that hasn't, you're able to go back and say, ah, well, what was my original design assumption? Can I actually add these two floors onto this building? What impact does that have structurally? What You know, you can feel and understand the buildings as a system and work out what it is you need to do. Without that information, you really are stuck and you're guessing. That's very timely. Thank you, Colin. So on the golden thread, a question specifically for you, but Mark, please jump in as well. What is the expectation of the BSR for the level of input from the fire engineer into all relevant prescribed documents as they evolve through the gateways? And how can we encourage PDs and PCs, so that's uh, you know designers and contractors, to ensure a cradle to grave fire engineering input. Well, that sounds like one for you there, Mark, to start with. Sorry. <laughs> uh, how to encourage that? Um, I'm, I'm kind of counting on the regulator to some extent to say, look, either the information that you've provided at each of the gateways evidences um, the, the proper understanding of and application of fire engineering knowledge or it doesn't. Um, I'm not looking for the regulator necessarily to look at the qualifications of the fire engineer, but I am expecting them to look at the documentation mm -hmm. and then say, was this produced by somebody who who is answering my questions and answering them thoroughly and answering them intelligibly or not? I think that's where the pressure is gonna come from. I mean, we're certainly encouraging our members to to manage up and manage out in terms of how they engage in these these projects under the new regime, rather than simply taking whatever contracts come along. Um, you know, there's going to be enough work. I said there's always going to be a shortage of fire engineers, and part of this is encouraging fire engineers to take the projects where they have the most chance of influencing successful um, completion. Thank you, Mark. Colin, anything you wish to add? No, I think that's um, that's that's that says everything that needs to be said. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, and this one's close to my heart, given my day job. Uh, given the various prescribed files and documents that need to be developed and submitted across the gateways process, do you feel there would be benefit in standardising them? And if so, will the BSR be doing that, or is that something you would look to the industry to do? So probably to Colin first. Yeah, I mean, I like these questions because it sort of it gives me a really good opportunity to be very succinct. BSR will not be developing templates or standardized documents. Industry will have to decide what is required. And I'll tell you for why is, is that I bet you that there are no two buildings that are the same. Yeah. That was my answer, too. If, if, if you can show me two buildings that are the same or you can show me what's the same about all buildings, I would be happy to entertain the idea of templating. But um, 
I, I think we might be on a fool's errand. There are certain elements of information, certainly, that I think we could all agree on, but which elements are required and to what degree is going to vary with every single project. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions here, and they're, they're all around the same thing. And it's probably quite timely given the Paul Morrell and Elise Day independent review of construction product testing. When we look at Gateway 2, people are asking, we'd like to know, will the BSR, building control, look at product testing and certification definitively on products? Is that something that will be looked at closely go, or more closely going forward? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example because this this does come up regularly. In, in my experience, uh, we'll often as a, I'll often have been produced or presented with um, a specification note or similar for a particular product. Let's take cavity barriers. Let's just be really controversial. Uh, so we all know the nuances around this, but let's take cavity barriers, and somebody will write on a drawing or write in a strategy cavity barriers to meet B3 or standard test yeah. or product specification or this performance requirement, fine. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. So I think the regulator from it, from the outset will be looking to understand, well, we, well, let's put it another way. We all get a fire door schedule. Mm -hmm. Invariably we'll have one as a, at a building control application stage. Why can't I have a cavity barrier or a fire stopping schedule? What product, where, is it tested for that particular scenario? Is it suitable and have you checked it? And if you can provide that evidence to the regulator, the regulator feels happy and assured. Now, if that ch product changes due to availability or testing criteria changes or something happens, fine, change it. But at least give us a starting point. We know what you're putting there and we know that it's the right product for the right place. So we will be asking that question. And if it's not there, we'll probably say no. No, thank you. Yeah, I spent, uh, Sorry. Okay. No, I spent a while in, in Bangladesh and things that, that I thought were uh, dead simple <laughs> from, from, from a regulatory uh, standpoint uh, suddenly became incredibly complex. You know, I thought I knew what a fire door was before I worked in, in Bangladesh. And, you know, most of the world, uh, the, the enforcement authority is going to look for a label on the door and the frame and the components. And if all of the elements are labeled properly, they're going to assume that they're they have a, a compliant fire door frame. We may do some measurements and, and a few other things to verify installation was correct. Um, but I, I found uh, that most of the fire doors we were receiving in Bangladesh, they had labels, but they didn't match the listings and they didn't match the test reports. And that was because we created the world's largest market for fire doors overnight. So we created an incentive for manufacturers uh, who are trying to meet a very unusual need in Bangladesh to produce a, a non-compliant product. So we rejected whole containers full of fire doors uh, because they were non-compliant. So I think the, the, the onus on fire engineers, principal designers, principal contractors is to trust but verify. Um, don't rely on uh, the superficial product conformity data that you get with a cut sheet or a sales brochure. Um, make sure that the product you're getting is the product you bought and yeah. that the product you bought is the one that was specified. Brilliant. Mark, thank you. Uh, a very complete answer and I think something we'll be talking about an awful lot more in the future. We'll, we'll have a few more dedicated sessions on construction products. I'm very mindful of the time so I just want to say a huge thank you to both Colin and to Mark for two great presentations and some really great q and A's. Um, as is the way, we'll have a, a chat with Mark at IFE Germany to see if there's, given we've had so many questions, whether there's any capacity to maybe answer some of the, the amazing amount of questions that have come forward in some sort of sheet to go forward that we can share with you, just to see if we can get those answers out. So look, that's it from me. Just to conclude, first and foremost, please give us your feedback. That's really, really, impo really important. Any ideas for future webinars, please put that in the feedback too. You know, with BSI working with IFE in partnership, we've got a number of upcoming events that are listed before you there, covering a number of areas. We want to keep doing them. We believe them to be really important and useful, and therefore, please keep your ideas coming forward. I think all that leads me to do is say thank you. Thank you to our speakers once again. We really appreciate it. Thank you to you for taking an hour out of your diary to, to, to join us today. Nearly 500 people in total, I believe. Uh, so that's a great to see.
at least a regional and a big thank you to my colleagues and team at BSI who make this all happen. That's it. Look forward to seeing you soon at our next event. Take care and have a good rest of the day. Bye for now.